That's correct. No, I, I, we haven't done anything about that. Just wipe them off, and that's all they can do. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Here at the Coca Cola six hundred. The Circuit City aerial platform giving us a glimpse of this track, which is rapidly drying out and getting us ready to go back racing. A uh, big cheer from the crowd as the command came to have the drivers report back to their cars. And indeed, that's just what they've done. As you see those cars lined up along pit road, 40 of the 43 starters still ready to go racing here well past halfway. Jeremy Mayfield beginning to cinch up the seat belt, get himself set to go again. Here's Rusty Wallace coming out. Let's go down to Marty Snyder. Well, Ken, most everybody knows the story tale of Tony Stewart's 1999 Memorial Day weekend. The double dip, first at Indy, and then the gutsy effort here at the 600. At the end of that race, Stewart was tired, but that wasn't his biggest problem. Tony Stewart is claustrophobic, and when it hits him like it did here last year, Stewart has real problems. Well, you see a shot of the car of Tony Stewart when he came in. Well, they didn't just put fuel in the car. The driver got a power bar. He got two bags of ice that he put down the front of his fire suit. Well, just a lot of fatigue. And then when the fatigue started setting in, I was uncomfortable in the car. And when that uncomfortable feeling came around and, and being claustrophobic and, and being strapped in a race car, I'm knowing that how much longer the race was, it was a real uncomfortable feeling to be in that race car at the time. You know, I have a job to do. I can't call timeout. I can't, there's no halftime break. You don't get a chance to just stop you got to keep going and there's a lot of people depend on me to do that there's a lot of guys at the shop and there's a lot of, of people with uh, home depot that depended on me to go out and do my job anyway so uh, you know we we had to just suck it up and keep going Stewart has been claustrophobic since he was a child it is not something he talks about much but it is nonetheless a daily nuisance this week Stewart was blasted in a trade publication for his poor attitude and treatment of the fans but Stewart says it's not the fans, or rather his claustrophobia that gets in the way. I mean, there's a lot of times when just in crowds it bothers you because it's a hot day outside and you get people that that aren't necessarily just around you, but they're really tight around you and, and they're pushing and shoving and uh, it, it gets to where it bothers you a lot of times. I'm not angry at him. I mean, he did what he had to do. Claustrophobia is a legitimate issue for Stewart. In his private airplane, the windows are extra large. The view helps with comfort. Even though it hit him here in last year's 600, that tends to be the exception rather than the rule. I've never had to quit a race, but I've, there's been times when I was very, very uncomfortable in the race car, and instead of concentrating on what I had to do to, to be faster or to be competitive, then you, you feel like at that point you're just hanging on and you're not able to do your job the way you should be. Stewart says his focus in the race car is what helps him get past his claustrophobia in most cases, but to claustrophobic, the fact he's even able to get into a race car and strap up is rather remarkable. Ken? The fact that he still deals with the press, and as they all do with the press and the fans, is so amazing. When you see them on these racetracks, right on the edge, it looks so easy. We all drive cars. But when you see them on these 24-degree banks, men like Kenny Snyder, then you get the uh, Schrader, you get this sense that at any moment something could give way. But they make it look as if that'll never happen. For the rest of us, if we ever made an effort like that, it'd be hello walls all the time. These people are the very best at their game, and we're about to see them 
Rouge restart this event and play it to the hilt in the Coca-Cola 600. Stay with us. Getting ready for a restart with Jerry Nadeau leading the upstart from Connecticut still in front past halfway. have not. Nope. Came the two times. Yep, okay. Came the two times. Okay. Yeah, it's not Um, Rick is back in the car, and they gave him a chicken dinner. And what else did they give him? A bag and a half of fluid. And bag and a half of fluid and a chicken dinner, and he's ready to go. So, Mass is back in the car. No driver has ever had more starts in the 600 than Richard Petty, 31. 1975, he flew to victory on this track, defeating some of the great heroes, Cale Yarborough, David Pearson, a young Darrell Waltrip, and Buddy Baker. There's the number 43 now, and Tim Fidewa has taken over. Kyle Petty made the call to allow Tim Fidewa to drive this car after John Andretti was injured, and he said, Fidoa earlier today to me, he said, I'm just flattered. I am just so honored to be able to sit in this race car. Tim Fidoa taking over for Andretti, and we're getting much closer to a start now. The drivers are in the cars. They've been strapped in. There's a final run taking place down the main straightaway by the jet dryers. Let's go quickly to Marty Snyder. And Rick Mass has been fighting food poisoning all day. This uh, caution or this rain delay has actually been a help to him. They went to the Infield Care Center. He got a bag and a half of IV fluid. They also gave him a chicken dinner, and car owner A.J. Foyt showed up when Robbie Gordon came. They actually came together, and so uh, Rick is going to tough it out and finish this race. Even though he does have food poisoning, he is going to finish the 600 miles at Charlotte. There's the number 14, currently in 17th place. The drying continues. It's just a matter of checking and making absolutely sure it's as perfect as it can be before they turn them loose to run some 180 to 190 miles per hour into turn one. And the command has just been given to crank them up. You heard the crowd respond, and very shortly, engines will fire and they'll begin to roll them out. We still have a couple of jet dryers out here on the track in the main straightaway doing a little polishing job on the speedway before we get back and go green to complete this 41st running. $3 million is at stake, a million dollar bonus for uh, Burton if he can stay up there and take it away from Nadu or whoever else comes to challenge in the final laps of this event. Red flag is still on the track, but not for much longer. There go the nets up in the cars. What a difference they have made in driver safety over the years. Here's Jeff Gordon getting ready. We're still waiting for that command to fire the engines and send them on their way. Now you can see them begin to roll. Indeed, they have fired them. And they're about to move out onto the track with Jerry Nadeau leading the way. The surprise, the dark horse in this race. 
And the question is, can he stay there and win for Rick Hendrick? Yes. Terrific. Okay, yeah, sure. Yep. They're taking... diamonds out there. Let's take a look at what has happened so far. See if we can get you up to date on how it all began and how we have come to where we are. This is the start. Earnhardt Jr. on the point. Falling back was the 25 and then coming back. Nadeau, here he is, getting by Bill Elliott and taking second place. And here he is up the outside and around Dale Earnhardt Jr. for the lead. Lap 80. Steve Park loops it coming into the tri-oval area and the double dog leg brought out the first caution of the day. Lap 117, Earnhardt Sr. with those strange looking colors on number three, brings the crowd to its feet. Nadu came right back, stacked them three high. He came through on the bottom, went back into first place. Lap 130, and Mike Bliss is out of control. Same area, turn four, able to gather it up, but it brought another caution. Lap 136, here is Earnhardt Sr. taking the lead from Jerry. Lap 151, a little love tap here. Robert Presley sends Scott through it, right into the laundromat. And look at this, father against son on the bottom of the racetrack. Dale Earnhardt and Dale Earnhardt Jr. alongside, and then Jerry Nadeau pulls up, scoots by once again, shows the supremacy of that Hendrick car. Lap 193, Jr.'s back at it, Dale Earnhardt Jr. New names, new faces making the difference. And then in lap 248, there were pit stops. Bobby Labonte, the heavy drink, left left for a while, stalled for a moment on pit road. And there's Dale Earnhardt Jr. getting out just in front of him. But Nadeau had stayed on the track, thinking the rain was going to come. They had been talking to him, and sure enough, the rains came. Red flag came out. It has been there for some time, and now we're back ready to go racing another time. With Nadeau in front, Jeff Burton in second, and to bring you more of the action, once again, here's Alan Bestwick. Thank you, Ken. 51 minutes under the red flag because of the rain, but now the car's rolling again under the yellow. With Dick Bergen and Buddy Baker, I guess the question is, once they open pit road, and it is still closed because they're running the jet dryers down the pit lane to get all the moisture off there, once they open the pit lane, we make the assumption Nadeau and Jeff Burton, who stayed out earlier, are going to have to come in for service. Almost guaranteed.